to our uh, welcome everybody to the to the second edition of our patents and the public interest series. Uh, my name is Charles Duan. I am a fellow with the uh, program on information justice and intellectual property at American University Washington College of Law. I've also spent the last 10 years working in the patents policy nonprofit space um, and have had the opportunity through that work to um, collaborate with all sorts of fantastic and diverse folks. Um, and I'm happy to be bringing them to the AU community and to the larger academic and law school community so that um, you can meet some of these folks, find out about their really interesting career paths and learn how if you want to be a public interest advocate, especially in the intellectual property or patent space, um, you can learn a little bit about, about what, that, what that area looks like. Um, today, I'm very excited to be joined by uh, my good friend and colleague, Alex Moss. Alex is the founder and executive director of the patent, um, or sorry, the Public Interest Patent Law Institute, or, or PIPLI, uh, which she just started very recently. So I'm looking forward to talking to her about some of the issues that, um, that, that the organization is working on. Um, it's a really interesting portfolio of cases and issues um, that they have, and also about how what it's like to start a new organization to um, to be a to be an entrepreneur in the in the nonprofit space. Um, so welcome, Alex. Uh, thank you so much, Charles. Thank you for for having this series and for inviting me. I feel very honored to participate, especially given the the folks that are present and the other guests that you have coming to speak. And I. Um, you know the uh, the as our organization name, despite being mouthful, um, you know I think it's one of the one of the goals is to really entrench the idea of public interest patent law, um, and I think you've you've been sort of on the the front line of carving out that space for for probably about the past um, ten years. So you know, thank you for all of your work, <laughs> uh, and and you know I think um, even even the series is kind of you know uh, uh, an important contribution to that because I think. You know, my, my hope is that, you know, 10 years from now, like public interest patent law is like something people think is normal and, and not uh, weird or new or different. Yeah, well, I'm my, you know, I think that's a, it's a great opportunity that we have to be able to talk with uh, with folks like you. Um, so why don't you tell me a little bit about just your organization and particularly um, the public interest in in patent law, right? That's you know, I think a lot of people think of patent law as this sort of this is sort of niche area. Um, what what's sort of the role of the public interest advocate in that in in that space of law and policy? That uh, I think a lot of people see patent law that way, and I, I sort of. You know, our goal is to sort of flip flip the idea and turn it around, and really think that the 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 patent office belongs to the public, and the goal of the patent system is actually to to produce benefits for the public. It's sort of a unique, actual unique um, policy agency in that its goal is really kind of like an aggregate, you know, macroeconomic uh, result, and that the goal is. You know, not not so much um, compensating individual inventors for their particular work, but ensuring systematically that inventors are uh, able to recover the costs of investment and in innovation, so that they can put it into future innovation. And as in addition to sort of by you know through that process, ensuring that there's just more new things coming out is giving them an incentive to publicly disclose and kind of put on a on a you know, uh, public record for posterity's sake, um, what they developed, uh, and I, I sometimes think it's worth remembering that this, this, that that exchange uh, emerged uh, as a tool in you know, the 18th century, and that's you know obviously before the internet, before telephones, and if somebody came up with something really cool in their basement and they died, it would probably die with them, uh, and you know in in that world the need to provide a really a real incentive to disclose and centralize knowledge for the future, I think makes more sense because I think as it's turned out, um, the you know, between the Library of Congress, the internet and university libraries uh, across the country and around the world, we, we probably don't look to the patent office as the place to, to you know, cap to, to store uh, every, every cool thing that's probably maybe should be where people go in an ideal world, but it's really kind of not quite turned out that way. 
Um, but but that core incentive of ensuring that the public is going to get more innovation and more knowledge that it otherwise wouldn't have is is, is the you know core value of the patent system, and that really is designed to achieve you know society wide uh, benefits. Um, and you know I think another thing that's happened over time is that the distance between people's understanding of technology has grown while our dependence and sort of intimate reliance on it has also grown. So we sort of bizarrely are like more tech, you know, more dependent on technology that's advanced uh, on a day-to-day -day level and also understand it less than ever. Uh, and, and, I, and I wonder, I tend to think that that, you know, in part is sort of distanced the public from the patent office because, you know, it, it increases the, the, the sort of sense that technology is itself a niche area when actually it's really pervasive, of, you know, to our lives. Um, and so I think that there's also a way that uh, encouraging the public to be more aware, active, and connected to what's happening in patent policy really also like ties pretty closely to efforts to kind of diversify the you know community of people who are working on technology generally and that and that you know as we you know broaden one community we'll broaden the other um, with it and, and benefit both so I think I think it's really uh, important to try to tell people like like this is your patent system it belongs to you it doesn't doesn't belong to the folks getting you know patents or uh, you know any 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 particular group or uh, entity, um, it's supposed to benefit the public and uh, nobody should feel, um, you know, nobody who's, anyone who's in law school is intelligent and thoughtful and has all the, all the intellectual ability they need to understand uh, patent policy and participate in, in debates. Yeah, so I love that framing, this idea that, you know, the patent system really belongs to us and that um, we're all so enmeshed with technology. And you work with some really interesting communities kind of in, in that space. You want to talk about some of the, some of the folks you've worked with um, that might not be seen as traditional participants in the, in the patent system, but nevertheless have an important stake in it. For sure. And, and that, I mean, one of, uh, trust me, I mentioned before I was here, I was at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and one of the reasons I wanted to start a, a patent specific organization was actually to, to talk to more communities because technology is so pervasive uh, and it, and you know, patent law affects every kind of technology field, including, um, you know, like, like one, one community I've been really talking to and really interested in how the patent system affects our um, farmers and organic seed developers and growers. And it, it, thanks to a Supreme Court case in the late 1990s, I think it's not early 2000s, that, that there are now utility patents on plants as well as a particular sort of plant specific patents. And as a result, uh, there's been a real impact on, on the seed growing community uh, and, and sort of in combination with the fact that in the agricultural industry as a whole, there's been more consolidation, um, you know, fewer big companies controlling more of the market. And some of those companies kind of come, or many of them come from the, the chemical world. Um, so, and so where, where patents for a long time have been really crucial to the business. Uh, and they've brought their business practices and sort of patenting culture to the agriculture world where, patents really hadn't been the norm and there had been different you know cultural systems for sharing and protecting knowledge so uh it's it's something that particularly small uh seed growers who aren't super sophisticated and familiar with the patent system don't have you know huge you know corporate uh law departments or resources have been uh pretty you know vulnerable and and to to you know uh being pushed out of the market by entities uh, with with patents and a lot of those uh, you know patents are also uh, I think would would you know may surprise folks that the patent office you know even kind of examines patents on plants on on plants and and you know given one might wonder how sort of helpful their prior research resources are um, but but so as a result you see things like th there is a example there's thing like the, a Mexican popping bean which I guess is it's like a bean that you could, instead of having to like soak and boil, you can sort of just fry it and it'll it'll like pop up and cook pretty quickly. So it's like actually really beneficial and it's existed for a long time. Uh, and some company got a patent on this Mexican popping popping bean that had that had been in nature. You know, they didn't they didn't genetically modify it, they didn't do anything uh, to it. 
Uh, and they also didn't commercialize their patents. So there was actually a researcher in Oregon who found saw this patent and stopped doing work in the field, um, and has just returned to it now that the, the they didn't the patent expired due to lack of um, payment of maintenance fees. Um, but so it's a it's a real you know concrete example um, of where uh, patents you know kind of prevented um, prevented innovation and in a space that you really might not think of might not even think of it as technology. Um, and uh, you know another another community. I mean, other uh, 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 other communities of folks. Um, you know, certainly, and I think you've heard from others who work with you know medical patients uh, and and advocates for uh, access to medicine. Um, but also, you know, thinking of like uh, of uh, um, repair shops and uh, are sort of a big, you know, technology repair places certainly, and um, open source developers. And in some cases, you know, the, the technology can have, you know, interesting uses. There's a, somebody in Poland who developed an algorithm, um, an open source algorithm for data compression. And it turns out it's, it's really useful for um, genomic data analysis and compression. And so I've uh, been talking to, you know, and recently, Microsoft got a patent on this algorithm, um, and so you know, genetic researchers are concerned about this, you know, software patent. And you might not necessarily think that that those things would be connected, but um, but but lo and behold, they are. So you know, it's really, uh, you know, and 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 frankly, like the, the sort of car manufacturers, car repair shops, all of those are becoming increasingly involved as cars basically become kind of software devices. Um, and so I think I think and I expect that this is only going to continue as you know medical devices are more connected to the internet. I think that that sort of every really it's going to be increasingly hard to find a product sector where patented technology isn't uh, at play. Yeah, so you know I, I I love this concept that you know it's just it's just so pervasive at this point the number of technologies and one of the areas I know you really specialize in is standard essential patents and that's really all about just sort of connectedness and internet technologies it's also in my opinion one of the most interesting and fascinating and most important fields um that's um that's in, in patent policy and I know you do a lot of work on that so you know can can you give sort of the the high level overview of kind of what the issue is what's going on there and why this affects people. Uh, for sure, it's, it's like a dream, right? one of my favorite topics and not something that comes up at like cocktail parties, not that I've gone to cocktail parties in a few years, but um, so thank you for giving me the chance. Uh, yeah, standard essential patents are, I feel like some of the things I said about the patent system, the complexity, uh, sort of non-transparency, all of those things apply kind of exponentially to, to standard essential patents in particular. Um, and and their patents that cover you know, so sort of the 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 first step of of understanding what they are is understanding what standards are, and at a broad level, those are just agreed upon rules for um, rules for products. So I mean, examples are there's a standard for you know electrical outlets for for AC DC voltage. The keyboard, the QWERTY layout is a standard, uh, and uh, you know all. We expect that from all computers and, and standards are incredibly beneficial because it means you don't have to learn how to type each time you buy a computer from a new manufacturer. And if you did, you know, if you figured out how to do that, you know, the Apple OS typing, uh, you probably would be very reluctant to get a different manufacturer's computer, even if it was better and it was cheaper, because like the, the learning cost of how to of how to type on it would be so prohibitive. So standards are really important to making sure we can access technology that there can be competitive markets and that we can kind of get the full the full benefit of of everything because what a what a ridiculous world if we were picking computers based on you know preferable keyboard layouts instead of all the other things that they do uh and and so in particular probably the the most though there's many kind of patents that the kind that are particularly relevant and contested these days are um ones that uh, pertain to communication standards so wi-fi uh uh, 3G, 4G, 5G. I think one that we forget about is is actually the web. You know, um, the 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 rules for uh, for for HTML and for uh, for you know how websites uh, communicate with each other. Uh, all of that is actually also a, a standard um, that is continues to be developed and, and expanded by the W3C. And so there are you know, lots and lots of patents that cover different aspects of these standards. And standards can be incredibly complex and multifaceted, especially if you think of you're thinking about a um, you know a wireless communication standard, which you know has to have aspects that 
uh, explain how you know the handsets work, how the infrastructure, communication infrastructure works, uh, and and all of sort of a whole ecosystem uh, technologically. Uh, and and in those cases, you you know, an example of like five G. I think that estimates now say like two hundred thousand patents have been declared essential to it. It's like a you know, jaw dropping uh, number. Um, but uh, you know, and and. The fact is that that standards are also something, and standard essential patents are, despite being incredibly important to, to how we use things, how we're you know communicating right now over Zoom, uh, including probably using you know multiple uh, standardized technologies to do that. Uh, the, I think one of the problems in some ways is that when standards work well, they're really really invisible. And, and they're designed to be, they're designed to allow users to focus on other things, other capabilities, and not have to worry about which device connects the best to the internet um, because it's got able to use a, you know, one protocol rather than another. And uh, as a result though, we're, we're not really aware when we're using standards. And, and we're not, we're certainly not aware when, when we're using standards that, are, you know, which particular patents um, we're using at any given time. Uh, but so standard essential patents are saying that really impact, you know, every, every aspect of our life. And again, are, are increasingly uh, used by a wider and wider range of devices. When people talk about like the internet of things, this idea of your refrigerator being connected to the internet, your, you know, your watch, your car, your, you know, home alarm, some of those things already are, um, that what that means is that they can connect to a wireless communication network, which means that they are using a standard. Uh, so when people talk, you say Internet of Things, it's like lots and lots of standard essential patents is, is basically what that means. Um, but that but that isn't really what we think about. And because a lot, you know, typically the the entities that have to deal with these patents are the product manufacturers or 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 in theory, perhaps the component manufacturers. So companies that are building refrigerators or building the components that they, you know, uh, incorporate. Uh, but as a result, they're not the end users, which which also creates a sort of distorted, a distorted market where you know consumers may be paying costs or seeing effects in their products, but but not being engaged in the in the you know relevant discussions where where those sort of the, the causal forces behind those effects are uh, created, uh, and, and so it's another place where people haven't you know. You know, consumers of technology are really, really affected uh, by patents and, and the policies governing them, uh, but they are relative. But, but consumers and consumer groups are relatively ab absent from the policy debates about them, and something that I think needs to needs to change to ensure that as we become more dependent on standards, they continue to be beneficial to consumers and not uh, not more detrimental. Yeah, so so that's fantastic. Sorry, I had a little trouble unmuting. Um, and um, you know, I, the the standards um, and sort of compatibility issues are really hitting home for me because of the fact that I've got to um, connect my I've got to connect my audio through my through my phone because I don't have the right connector to connect to my laptop. So you know, those standards really just touch everybody. Um, I think you know, I'd love to to sort of turn the conversation a little more toward. Uh, what's going on in terms of the public interest space? How do you get into this? Um, number one, I'd like to invite any of the students particularly, but anybody, if you have questions about, you know, what's it like to be in this space? Um, what are the sorts of things that you're working on? How do you get a job in this area? Um, feel free to, you know, drop questions in the chat um, or otherwise raise your hand. Um, I'd love to make this a, to, to make this a conversation about, um, you know, just, just what an interesting space this is. But, you know, kind of sticking to the, the standard essential patents issue um, first, you mentioned, you know, there's a real need for more public voices in this space. What are the opportunities that people have? And what are the opportunities that you take advantage of to try to weigh in on these sorts of issues as a nonprofit organization? Like, what are, what are the sort of tools of advocacy that you use in this space? Uh, that is a good question and one that hopefully is the, the answer is continuing to evolve. Uh, but I'd say sort of like the, the most obvious and, and transparent and accessible layer is that um, a lot of government agencies and non-governmental agencies, specifically the organizations that set standards, um, they, they, they have to make decisions and policies governing standards generally. 
And they frequently will, when they're doing that, um, when they're you know, defining their patent policy or changing their patent policy, they will, they will not always, but often ask for comments. Uh, and that's one you know, important opportunity to weigh in, especially because a lot of organizations uh, or entities seem to, seem to care how many comments are supplied for a particular side. So just, uh, you know, sort of su substance aside, just like being a voice in that field, every single voice has value. And, and again, because it's actually not a, a space where you've got hundreds of thousands of people weighing in, you know, relatively small number of voices can, can really shift the, um, you know, shift the scale and, and really change what it looks like to policymakers. It's also one where typically consumers and their interests aren't being expressed. So it's a even more, can you have a, a substantial impact in like getting that view across because, you know, that's, that's not going to be what, you know, mo most of the, the, you know, you've got folks, companies that use standards saying, oh, they need to be, we need, to, we can't afford to make products if we can't, um, you know, access the standards and you've got other, the standard essential patent holders or, or licensors saying, you know, we can't uh, develop technology if we're not getting rewarded for our patents. And no one's really saying like how, how this is going to affect people. Um, you know, what's going to happen to the standard? What's going to, what's this going to mean for jobs, for access to technology? And so there's, there's a lot of things to say, a lot of opportunities to, to add to the debate. Um, there are, of course, there are also, you know, in addition to like policy comments, you know, there are, uh, there are, there's litigation that raises these issues. I'm sort of smiling because the litigation has not gone very well <laughs> in recent times, but that's an opportunity for, you know, amicus briefing, I'd say also potentially an, an opening for um, public impact litigation, uh, though that that haven't really seen that, but I, I, think, that, I think there are possibilities there. Um, and I, I think also, uh, I mean, it, that brings me to sort of another point, which is sort of like cre creating opportunities. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I think I, I can say, say this though, this, uh, hasn't gone kind of out to the world or publicly. So I'd, I'd sort of ask folks not to, n I, I'm not too worried that everyone's going to start talking about this, but I, I would sort of say to, to keep it, uh, relatively quiet, but like we're working on a letter to the, um, you know, DOJ asking them to look at some standard essential standard essential policy decisions they've made and, and to, to look again at them. And so, you know, another, you know, you can sort of always assume that the, the companies with like powerful lobbyists don't stop asking for things because they lost um, once, you know, they, they, that they, they will, they will keep at it. They, they, they don't kind of go home and say, all right, I guess we're going to have to figure something else out. Um, and, and so I, you know, I think it kind of is, moves the public interest group community to, to have that same tenacity. And just because, you know, one, one battle was lost in one administration or under one uh, set of conditions that, you know, uh, when those change, you know, don't, don't give up the fight, keep, keep asking. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, the standard central patents in particular, there's a lot of different government agencies that are potentially involved, the DOJ, the FTC, the PTO, NIST. So, so all of those are sort of different potential, you know, avenues for public input and for proposing or asking for different kinds of policy solutions. There's also courts, and of course, there's also legislature. And there are legislative proposals, I think, are floating around. I'm not sure how many have been introduced, but um, definitely being discussed. Uh, about um, ways of affecting SEP policy and licensing. And I'd al I also think you know, that this is a space where um, academic uh, literature and scholarship is, and, and research of all kinds is really, really useful. There's frankly a lot of research that some particular companies funds, uh, fund and, and not enough um, research focused on the, the consumer perspective. And, and I think that's also an area where public interest groups can really contribute. And I'd also say even, you know, public education. Like, I think, I think you know, somebody said to me, you know, like, you know, we've seen kind of consumer credit and finance become an issue that, that a lot of people understand and care about and get that that's important, even though it's really complicated and kind of boring. I think it's way more complicated and boring than patent law. But, uh, you know, my view, there's no reason the same isn't true about, you know, SEPs and, and standard essential patent policy, but that's, but that's going to take time. Uh, so, you know, just, just uh, being, a, I think, a public interest group that's willing to, to talk about these issues and kind of bring them to the people. You're, you're not going to be 
uh, meeting demand from the public by giving them information and content about SCPs, but that's a place where you can, you know, bring 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 the public to these issues by finding ways to communicate about them and explain them that that translate how important they are. So, um, lots of lots of different avenues and and things that uh, public interest folks can contribute. Yeah, so that's fantastic. It seems like there are just so many avenues that you can weigh in on, um, so many different proceedings, so many different agencies. Um, you're a very small organization as far as I, as far as I remember. <laughs> um, how, how, how do you manage all of that? That's a lot of, that, that sounds like a lot on your plate. Well, obviously we don't do we don't do all of the things that I, I just mentioned and you know in particular we're not we're kind of one one uh, one line is that you know we're, we're really not a lobbying organization that that focuses heavily on legislation i mean there's some legislation that we really really care about and so we'll we'll, we'll sort of save our our lobbying voice or advocacy voice grassroots advocacy voice for that but you know thinking that there, there's other groups that are you know better positioned at that and frankly probably a lot of the um you know uh pub you know uh creation of like you know attractive educational materials and and you know that's that's not something that um you know we have the resources to do at this point um but uh you know frankly a large part of our ability to do different things is thanks to the fact that this community does have so many people who are interested in and 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 also you know, looking to people that might be like on the periphery of the community to like bring them in to, to collaborate with. So like I, I worked on um, with the, the revolving door project about some transparency and ethics issues relating to the patent office. They're not patent specific, but that that issue of government, you know, accountability and transparency and, you know, corruption like that, that's that's important in every uh, government agency. And I think it's really important to, to work with groups that work on these issues that that cut across sectors and be like, by the way, patent patent office is part of, you know, part of the government too. your concerns apply equally here. Um, and honestly, like invaluable are law school clinics and law school, law school students um, that, you know, if, if uh, I'm not sure what, what stage of law school everyone's at, but, um, you know, clinics really do make a huge difference. And I, I know our organization works with a lot of clinics and has gotten invaluable assistance and done things we could never otherwise do. And I know that other organizations have too. So I think the combination of like working with a broader range of partners, including those who aren't really you know, in the space, so I'm, you know, you're dragging their time and resources into the patent world, um, and then, and then uh, benefiting from the, from the, from the brilliance and diligence of, of law students. Yeah, so that, so I'm sure that everyone's been, um, delighted to hear that, um, that you work with uh, law school clinics. I know you've done a number of great projects with them, and, you know, I, like, personally, I've just found the opportunity to work with law students who just can really delve into a project. Like, that's just such a huge benefit to the, to the public interest space. Yeah, and I've, I've found sometimes, in some cases, like, students have backgrounds or interests that are so invaluable. There's a letter to, um, to senators that we're working on with with a law clinic and somebody just joined the team who's like yeah I you know I worked on the hill for like three years and it's like okay like let's you want to you want to just take over this then because uh, you know more than I do about about this issue about how to communicate then or um, we we submitted comments about uh, patent eligibility and one student um, had a really uh, knew like a U.S. Army Corps engineer who had, was involved in like the wastewater testing for COVID, and that had a connection to patent eligibility um, because of the the technology of like searching for genomic variants in, in, in wastewater, uh, and got like a quote from them on on the importance of patent eligibility. Of that and it's like wow, that that you know I would never have thought of that, let alone been able to do that. Uh, so yeah, law, law students bring amazing ideas and resources to uh, projects. Yeah, so that's fantastic. I think it's really a um, it, it's really a testament to just what you were saying that patent law ends up affecting so many um, people from so many different backgrounds that folks who come in with backgrounds that may not seem like they're relevant to patent law actually end up being um, very relevant. Uh, we've got a question in the chat. Um, um, it seems that Amanda is asking about your thoughts on the new patent eligibility eligibility le legislation. I know you have a, a lot of thoughts about that. It's like it's like the only question that I might be more excited to answer than like tell us about SAPs is like talk about the Tillis legislation. So um, at the background I'll say is that there 
there have been efforts to do what the TILA's legislation proposes doing in terms of expanding patent eligibility for lots and lots of things for at least four years. You know, Charles and I both testified in hearings in the Senate in 2018. And at that time, I think it was June. And they said, well, in August, we'll have a bill. And they didn't. And then, frankly, they had backdoor secret meetings with a whole range of public interest groups that no, nobody ever ended up talking about, and as well as big companies. And that didn't, you know, the theory was, oh, well, we'll come up with a consensus bill. That didn't happen. And so this bill is, is really about about as one-sided as one could really envision in terms of expanding um, patent eligibility. And, you know, I think another sort of important like background is that the the current law that you have to, that, that a patent, whoever invents a new and useful um, you know, composition of matter uh, process or uh, composition of process uh, improvement thereof, but I'm, I'm Composition of matter process, maybe it's manufacturer. I'm, I'm, I'm article. Of, anyhow, I'm th that 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 language has referral well, of terminology in patent law. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's, I should I should have that really down. But but that 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 rule, that sort of basic foundational principle, has basically been like the law since like 1793. Like we've always required new and useful, and this legislation wants to take new out of the requirements for uh, patent inventions, which is you know when you think again about the the whole purpose of the patent system to ensure there's more new things right like if you take out the new part um are you even talking about patents here uh because the whole idea is to to generate new things things that don't already exist um and and so I, the the sort of at the most simple level they have taking the word new out of the definition of what's eligible for a patent is in my view like groundbreaking, shocking, and really horrifying because it, it does upset this fundamental notion that to get a patent, you have to add something new. It's not about claiming things that already exist, no matter how useful they are, no matter how hard to find they were. You know, it, it, it's you know, learned in law school, you know, patents are not a reward for sweat work. Um, it's really got to be a sort of innovation beyond what exists that's attributable to, to human mind. Uh, coming up with it, and so taking out new means, all right, we're 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 recognizing, almost conceding that we're going to be granting patents to things that aren't that aren't new, that that either weren't invented by this applicant or weren't invented by any human, uh, and, and that should be concerning. And and in um, more specifically, you know, the bill, uh, uh, the 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 bill. Uh, makes very clear that it, it sort of addresses and undoes these categories of ineligible subject matter that have existed for a long time. So the Supreme Court has held for you know, over a hundred years that you know, ideas um, in the abstract aren't patent eligible. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the Einstein, you know, MC equals squared, you couldn't get a patent on, that's, that's an abstract idea. Uh, that products of nature, you know, the, um, you know, uh, th things, you know, the, 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 the herbal remedy that, that exists, you know, in the leaf that people, whether people have been using or not, that that's something nature created. So that by itself can't be patented. And then laws of nature, which again, you might make it, you know, like gravity or even kind of more uh, generic laws, like, you know, when, you know, an economic type law of, of you know, when, you know, supply, uh, you know, about like supply and demand and how they interact. But that these um, that these uh, that these things are um, not patentable, and so this really undoes those categories. And I think and and uh, I think purports to incorporate important aspects of them, but in ways that will practically not provide any meaningful limits. So, for example, there's a discussion that they focus on products of nature and human genes. And it's like they, they, it makes clear that you know human genes, as they are in the body, aren't eligible for patents. But once they're different, they're eligible. Well, any 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 use of a gene is going to be different from what is in your body, in the human body. It's at the very least going to be you know extracted as a portion of it. Uh, and in the in the myriad case, the Supreme Court decided you know they recognized that like. Look, this this sequence has been separated from the rest of the genome. That that is that is a difference 
between what exists in nature and, and doesn't. But what's important here is the information in that gene, right? The test is looking for this information because it indicates a higher likelihood of breast or ovarian cancer. And so you wouldn't say that something doesn't infringe because they, they changed, you know, a, 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 they added a different nucleotide to the end of the sequence. You're gonna be concerned about whether they're using this information and that's what exists in nature. Uh, so, so this idea that, you know, oh, as long as there's a difference from, from it, how it is in the body or how it is in, the, in nature, that that's really an open door to every single patent because they're all, in terms of thinking about what infringes, they're, they're all going to, to have some, some difference. Um, and so that, this is the second follow-up question about clarified. So I'm going to say something first. The law is clear. There has been a real uh, effort to, uh, and, and many voices, you know, many people have said, the law is not clear. It's so complicated. It's not clear. It's so complicated. This is not true. Um, there, there, the ACLU has done very good uh, studies that show that like um, district courts are affirmed on patent eligibility decisions at a higher rate than like most other issues of patent law. The Patent and Trial Appeal Board is affirmed by the Federal Circuit at a higher rate on patent eligibility issues than on like most other patent issues. In looking, you know, at the case, there are some close cases, but there are many, many cases that don't get litigated because it's very clear things are not eligible or that don't get appealed because they're not ineligible or where there aren't written decisions. The Federal Circuit often affirms without writing um, decisions where district courts found claims ineligible. So we sort of have a disproportionate amount of case law and opinions about closer cases. And it's important not to, to, to overlook the many, many clear cut cases that aren't uh, nullified by this handful of, of some closer cases, right? That, that, that's, that's not the fact that there might be some cases that could go both ways doesn't mean that there aren't lots and lots of cases where the result is very, very, very clear. Uh, and uh, uh, and when you think about the law and things that are unclear, you know, I, I don't, I'm sure that the law has even changed, but, you know, I remember, you know, personal jurisdiction and like minimum contacts and, you know, the concerns of justice that it was like, she seemed super wobbly and fuzzy on this kind of basic thing of like, where can you bring, you know, a lawsuit? And the notion I mean, to me that patent eligibility is confusing in the context of, of regular law is, is just wrong. And even within the area of patent law, there are far more confusing and contradictory and inconsistent and unpredictable doctrines. Standing to sue is one of them. Um, the uh, rules around written description and enablement, which there's a, a petition before the Supreme Court now for cert, are in, the, the written description cases are actually like irreconcilable from the federal circuit, just flat out. I'd also say obviousness, it's not clear and work to me because it seems like the, 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 the Supreme Court's KSR decision on that has, has effectively not, not been applied. So I think it's wrong. I think it's, it's a, I think it's wrong when people say that patent eligibility is particularly confusing or unclear. And I think that argument is typically made by people who, or entities that want there to be more patents on things that are ineligible. It's unclear because there are, because if they want it, it's unclear because it means they lose sometimes. And if they wanted to make, the best way to make things clear would be to make clearer lines about what's not eligible. And to say, I, I think, like, for example, um, methods of organizing human activity are not eligible for patent. I think that would create a lot of clarity. Or you could say, you know, any, it, like, the way to create clarity would be to create very, like, targeted exceptions that, you know, um, you know, methods of using naturally occurring genes, any are, are you know, method, you, you could just write into law uh, the, the existing, um, restrictions and then perhaps expand on them to some areas where the case law has focused like this they did methods of organizing human activity uh and, and or things that are you could have a debate a policy debate about whether software in the absence of hardware should be eligible that i don't think that's the most fruitful debate uh, ultimately but i think that you you if you wanted to make things clearer actually like clearer bright lines on what's not patentable that actually have meaning would be the way to do it. But I, but I don't, but I don't think that clarity is necessary. And I also think that the law as written is going to create so many questions. It, you know, every patent lawyers, the, what they do, you know, their bread and butter is fighting over the meaning of words in a patent. 
like there are numerous cases on the meaning of a and the that go different ways. Sometimes a uh, means one, sometimes it means a entire group of patients, sometimes it means one or more. You know, it, it, so it, it, there's, by any time you change the words and give new words, you're just saying, here patent lawyers, <laughs> fight over this stuff, make more money. And there's a lot of terminology like technology and uh, you know technological application and things like that that have no clear meaning, and where there's just going to be huge amount of like uncertainty about what those what those words mean. It's going to be uncertain what the effect of you know pre-existing cases are, and the Supreme Court has indicated that that some of the their holdings are based on the Constitution. And so the, the statute can't undo the constitutional limits. And so there's gonna be uncertainty about that interaction. And so I see that this, this law is going to create like exponentially more uncertainty uh, and, lack, and, and, and lack of clarity than what we have today. And that though it's just that those who are losing uh, and want more patents than the law allows, instead of saying like, we want more patents, they, they have moved on to saying the law is unclear, that's the problem. No, the, the problem is not the law is unclear. The problem is that the law is clear and it's not in your favor. Um, so that that is that is my take on that. I realize there are many different views, but I, I would say that the data does not support them. Uh, and and uh, that's an example where folks that have a lot of experience in the patent space, you know, maybe like a former patent office director, you know, they they have a, a often sort of I think intimidate people out of being part of the debate by suggesting, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. I, I know everything there is to know about patents. Um, in fact, like anybody here can 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 probably read like can read every Supreme Court case on patent eligibility. There aren't that many of them. Uh, it's it's a knowable body of law, and uh, and and you know particularly based on 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 the the patent office's approach to to this, um, the there's good reasons to doubt whether the you know former directors have understood the law correctly. I mean. To the, to the extent that I've had examiners contact me anonymously to complain about the pressure they've gotten from their supervisors to grant patents that they think are ineligible, uh, specifically that the that the during last director they during under the last director they they lost the ability to access cases that they used to get uh, reg be able to like read cases and use cases on on 101 and they were like their their access to cases was literally like cut off uh, and they were instructed not to look at case law so. If, if there is confusion and uncertainty, it is because the patent office isn't applying the law. So it's, you know, I think it's just, um, it's a real testament that like, it's important to have people who are looking at these sorts of issues um, with, 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 with the, the sort of depth that you're looking at them and having like folks like the ACLU who can do the sort of empirical research. Um, I think that it's fantastic that you're able to talk about these sorts of things. Um, so I do want to get back a little to talking about, you know, how you got here. So, you know, tell me about, tell me about what brought you to, to founding a, um, to founding a patent not, policy nonprofit organization like uh, was this something that you'd wanted to do right out of law school is this something that kind of came to you how did you how did you get there uh, yeah no um not at all i i i didn't even I, I sort of fell down the rabbit hole of patents sort of at each at each phase of of things i did i i didn't expect in law school i thought actually i would do more copyright but i ended up being very finding patent law really interesting and communities of, of technology developers really exciting to work with and then I ended up clerking at the federal circuit. Um, and, and I'd say that's where like, I kind of like really fell down the rabbit hole all the way, got, got, got hooked on patents, if you will. Uh, and then I, I did, I litigated at a small firm and a big firm. And I was very careful to go to firms where I could do things other than patents as well as patents, which is somewhat challenging because some, a lot of firms will have like a patent group and you're in the patent group, you do patents. And if you're not in the patent group, you don't do patents. Um, there are sort of fewer generalist firms. But every time I made that decision, I would end up wanting to do patents and really not wanting to do other things. Like I, I, I it, you know. So uh, I, I then went to EFF to focus on patents and again thought kind of like, oh, it'd be nice to do other things too, do some copyright. Uh, but, but, but basically over the time I was at EFF, you know, the, the patent policy debate uh, really swung in a patent maximalist direction very extremely. Um, to a degree that I hadn't anticipated and, and which meant there was just like so much stuff to do on that front. It really wasn't time to do lots and lots of other things. Uh, and especially because there aren't that many public interest groups doing doing patents. And I think the other, and I never thought I would like start a, a nonprofit, uh, but I'd say the real change for me was like actually COVID um, because I, I think that's the point where it became very clear that 
perhaps especially in light of the, the kind of backlash against technology companies, that it's really important to be able to talk about and advocate for the patent policy issues that affect different types of technology, including both things like software and things like vaccines. And I think actually there, the, the, a lot of the dynamics and principles are the same. Like we talk about the internet having network effects, that it's more valuable to any one user, the more people are connected. And the same is true of vaccines. You know, a vaccine that only you have and only you get is actually not gonna be very protective, but a vaccine that everyone gets is actually more effective for any one individual. And technologies like that are, are not good fits for a system that depends on exclusivity um, the way the patent system does. And so, you know, a lot of the motivation was really seeing that there was a need to, to talk about uh, different types of technology and to work with groups that do amazing work, but, but many of them focus on particular types of technology, on startups, on medicine. Um, and, and it sort of was like, uh, there wasn't a, a platform or a group that could bring them all together. And I think I found myself working uh, working with a lot of medical access groups on like a, a letter about um, what the next patent office director and what they could be. And kind of realizing in the process, you know, as I was dealing with, you know, folks at IMAC who do medical access um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of frankly patient groups that like, it didn't really make sense for EFF to be, to be coordinating this effort uh, and, and, you know, and, and wanting in the letter to be, you know, I think it's such a, it's, it's something that people understand of how patents, I think, affect um, access to medicine. That's an issue, a place where people understand and the impact of patents more um, viscerally. And it's, I think it's a real disadvantage not to be able to talk about that. And so I, I was, that was really the sense that, you know, in, in this moment, there's not hopefully going to be a public health crisis of equal proportions in my lifetime. And that there's also hopefully not, you know, at this time of sort of real intense, um, you know, partisan, but, you know, partisanship, even, even within the patent policy world, which isn't the same as the, the political uh, divide. Uh, but that it was really important to be able to create as broad uh, a coalition and, and work with as many different groups and bring as many group, different groups into the field. And so, you know, like, like working with organic seed growers, like I wouldn't have been able to fit that into like my portfolio at, at EFF. So it was really just seeing the need that was there. And, and that said, EFF was like, has been amazingly, it was amazingly supportive and, and, and understood, um, you know, what, what, I, what I was seeing. And so it, it was a little bit of, of, of kind of seeing a need and, and a leap of faith and thinking, um, you know, uh, uh, remembering, fr frankly, when I was in when I was in college, I was very interested in uh, uh, the European Union, and I thought, um, you know, if if the EU doesn't really like figure out some important issues, uh, you know, uh, about immigration and diversity, and, and uh, like we're going to be back in in World War II, uh, and 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 kind of seeing that 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 sort of happened, I thought, you know seeing things, I was similarly concerned about where things were going in the, in the patent space and thinking, okay, like I'm, I'm a bit older now. I don't want 10 years from now to say, oh, things really did get worse. And I sat around and, and saw that coming and, and just kind of uh, stayed, uh, stayed in my corner. And so uh, I, I felt like, look, uh, this, this is a moment to, um, to, to take a, to, to take a step and, and try to address this and, um, you know, go, go down fighting. <laughs> Yeah, so so that's just so fantastic. Just you know the the sort of passion that that I hear of like you know going beyond just one technological area and saying like look this is a huge problem and like I really want to um, have a part of fixing it. Um, you know I think that there are a lot of there are a lot of folks in this world there are a lot of students um, at, at at schools across at law schools across the country who would you know are similarly passionate about issues. How do you get into a field like this? It's a like you know it's a it's a tough field because you know there's small organizations the opportunities um, don't show up on on campus recruiting and those sorts of things. What would be your advice to a student who, you know, has these big ideas and wants to get into this field? Um, you know, where, where are the starting points? Who should you talk to? What are the sorts of things you think that um, would be good for people to know? So at, a, at a high level, I'd say is like, follow what your interests are and kind of hold on to them. I think I, I mentioned to Charles earlier, when I was in law school, the like standard thing was like, privacy law isn't a thing, like privacy is over. It's not gonna be, it's not an issue for policy or litigation. And like, wow, why did that turn out to be wrong, right? Like, you know, and and so, um, you know, uh, and and my professor at Harvard told me that uh, that the right wing in Europe was over and no longer worth studying, um, which uh, uh, was he died before he he learned how how wrong that was. But um, 
uh, but so, you know, pe your, your, your professors are very smart, but sometimes they're wrong. And if something matters to you, you, the fact that it isn't important to everybody now doesn't mean it won't be in 10 years. And then the other thing I'd say is hold on to what you're interested in and have a long view. Because sometimes things that you do that aren't like directly what you're interested in end up having relevance in 10 years to that thing. You're, and you'll think, oh my goodness, it's so good that I did that thing I was completely bored by because now I understand like how to deal with this thing that I'm fascinated by. And you just, you don't see that coming. Uh, and so I'd say also in terms of like finding jobs and opportunities to kind of have a long, a long, uh, a long term, you know, plan and to to follow your interests. You know, if you if you reach out, like people love hearing that. Oh, your work is interesting. I'd love to ask you about that. Like lawyers love to talk about um, what they do, and probably especially people in the public interest field to to hear that folks are interested. So if you know, like you should, should feel very free to reach out to people who you're interested in talking to and asking them uh, and sort of feel very much like that that's not a burden and if people don't want to respond they won't respond um and and you know and like keep in touch and 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 if it's oftentimes like if it's somebody who, that your work isn't in, you're interested in what they're doing you probably will have like a natural connection and wouldn't even if you don't end up working for them you might end up it's amazing how many times I've ended up working on something where I collaborated with somebody I had a job interview with or you know frankly like future law school classmates you know like end up doing things that especially you know that are you know they end up being in the policy office that's doing the the issue that you're working on and so that that sort of network it's like you really can't see now where things are going to be in in 10 years and I, i'm going to specifically answer this question from amanda i'm going to say what um there are some places that will require technical degrees but not all of them and what one and and my somewhat snarky that's with respect thing i would actually say is probably like the better firms don't require technical degrees. It's a little obnoxious to say it's not entirely true, but but like a little true. Um, and and uh, and what a, a lawyer told me, I because I didn't have a technical degree, and I asked a, um, a lawyer Neil Chatterjee at at Oric this, and he said, "What's really important is to show that you can learn technology and that you're not scared of it. That's what matters." And I, I've had friends who have technical backgrounds who say to me, "Alex, like I know I know this one issue." very, very well that was like cutting edge 20 years ago. And like, it's never come up in a case of mine. So, I mean, I think I think what they really, what people who have a technical background really know is how to learn technology, how to talk about it and how not to be intimidated. And so what I would say is like, go learn, immerse yourself in some technological field of law um, or some patent issue and be able to talk excitedly and cogently about it and, or, you know, write a paper, you know, find some, or, you know, go to a law firm and, and really push to get a project. And that that's going to establish you. And, 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 and that's going to ultimately mean more to a lot of places than the fact that you may have had an undergraduate degree in, in a particular field. And, and, and frankly, to kind of, yeah, there are going to be some doors that aren't open. And I think the, probably general advice is yeah when doors don't open um it, it you, you know when we don't get opportunities we don't know the things we wouldn't have liked about them or the things that wouldn't have worked out about that path and so you can maybe take it as a sign that like there were things that were there were, th that was an indicator of other things that weren't a good fit as well and perhaps for the best in the long run and this is a field you know where where um patent law uh, where you know there's Technology is, we're going to have technology. It's not going anywhere. Uh, patent law isn't going anywhere. Some people want to abolish the system. I, I certainly, I, I do disagree. I also think that they will never win, right? Like this is written into the constitution. So these things aren't going anywhere. And, and uh, you know, there's going to be demand. And I think generally in the patent space, there's always going to be probably, there's probably almost, it's hard for me to imagine anytime soon that that there will be far uh, more patent lawyers and people interested in patent issues than there is work to do in those fields. So I, I would, I would be, um, you know, keep, keep looking for other jobs, develop credentials and signs of your expertise. And, you know, I also would strongly encourage people um, to clerk and either at, you know, including at the district court level. And there are some district courts that do lots and lots of patent cases. And often, the district court clerks don't want to do patent cases. So if you go to, you know, a judge in the Northern District of California and say, you know, I'm really excited about your docket, but I also love, you know, I'm really excited to work on patent cases, they'll probably be really excited to hear that. 
Um, and so, so will your, and your co-clerks will be really excited to hear that too. Um, you know, I mean, I go to the federal circuit, we were like fighting over patent cases, you know, sometimes it wasn't, that wasn't the situation. Um, but, but, you know, I, I certainly would encourage, there, there are like, and, and, and I think it's very unlikely that, that district court clerks would like require technical backgrounds, even in, you know, for, for, because they, for patent cases for lots of reasons, but not least, you know, if you're going to be communicating with a judge or a jury, um, just as important as a technical background is like a human communication or, you know, writing skills background. And I think sometimes underestimated in, in patents, I actually sometimes think like linguistics is more important than technology because patents are really documents. And a lot of patent law is interpreting the meaning of words in a document where you can't ask the author what it means. That's like textual analysis, it's translation of, of dead languages. You see a lot of classicists in the field. Um, and, and certainly being able to communicate about technology in a way that is understandable to people without a technological background is 99% of the time, like aside from internal office memos, that's what you're doing. So, so I, I also think uh, that, that the skills um, that if, you know, that for people with technical backgrounds, often developing those skills is something they really value. And thing I actually always remember is you know, Judge Chen, who's federal circuit judge and former PTO solicitor, um, has, has spoke to, to clerks about how much he worked on his advocate, his oratory skills and his writing skills because he like didn't want to be pigeonholed as like a technical expert person. Um, and I think that that frankly is also something, you know, perhaps a, a good thing to tell yourself is that, you know, you, you, uh, when you find the right place, you'll actually have a lot of opportunities because you don't you don't have that concern. And I definitely have seen people with with technical backgrounds get sort of okay. Like every time you're doing the the expert report, and um, that sounds really cool at first, but like for twenty years, you might you might want a broader palette. Um, so so yeah, I would I would strongly like if anyone ever is doubting if whether you have a uh, technical background, like reach out to me and I will, I will be glad to talk to you about that and try to encourage you and think about um, what you can do. Cause that's a, that's a particular passion of mine. And, you know, I'd say like, ultimately the people who make patent law, well, you know, whether they're in this Congress or the Supreme court, like they don't have technical backgrounds either. Well, speaking of folks who have um, excellent communication backgrounds, I'd like to thank Alex for, um, for excellent speaking skills on these really, really fascinating issues. Um, we're unfortunately out of time for our conversation today, but please feel free to get in touch with either of us um, if you're interested in talking more, if you want to know more about what this sort of career is like. Um, and please also join us for the next edition of our series. We'll be taking a break for next week and we'll be back, I believe on the 19th on our regular time, uh, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. Uh, thank you for all, thank you all for joining. It's been really great talking with you, Alex. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you everyone for, for coming. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I hope you all go to the rest of the series because the other speakers are, are some of my favorite uh, people and, and friends and colleagues as well. So enjoy. Thanks so much. All right.